when, when there are people being, when, whenever there's people being murdered or there's some type of tragedy or something, and you have people who immediately, their immediate response is to either laugh about it or joke or celebrate it or, or say, to me, that's really psychopathic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The people have, people have their politics, people have, you know, their sides that they lean to and they take, but regardless, I always say, regardless of my, my politics, regardless of my beliefs, whatever, when innocent people die, man, woman, child, um, my immediate response is, is just sadness. It's not, Oh, how can I use this to push my political agenda? How can I do this to stick it to the, stick it to the left or stick it to the right or attack this person or attack. And it's like, people just jump on these opportunities every single time. And I guess maybe it's always been like that, but we didn't used to see it. And now it's just, you see it on the scale of millions or even billions of people all engaging and yeah, it's, it's, it's nasty. I don't know what, share your thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you're exactly right. Social media simply allows the, the, the opportunity to amplify people's dark hearts. You're exactly right. Look, uh, I often refer to this example when I talk about sort of a, a universal code of morality. Uh, there's a famous clip that ISIS had put out many years ago where they were summarily executing, I think about 1,500 Muslim men who were being led to the uh, uh border of the uh, the shores of the Euphrates River and then were shot in the head. And so there's this kind of long orderly line and every single one of those is being taken. When I watched that, I wasn't a Jewish guy. I was a human being who was unbelievably angry at seeing this, right? Meaning that my moral calculus did not say, oh, this doesn't involve me. It's It's not... It's not, they're not killing Jewish people. So who cares? I saw a bunch of young men who had all lives ahead of them that were being just put down as if they were a pieces of Kleenex. So you're exactly right. I think decent people can see a Palestinian child that has nothing to do with the fight who's suffering and go, this is bad. And they can see the Jewish girl who was raped and killed and say, this is bad, but you're exactly right. Most people, unfortunately, view the world through the prism of coalitional psychology. So they don't rise above that. They don't have a deontological set of, of ethics. Deontological simply means some absolute truths, right? It is always something that you should grieve when an innocent person dies, period, right? But that's not how regrettably the architecture of the human mind is structured for most people it's blue team versus red team it's us versus them and i think that's by the way one of the reasons why uh if i can just segue to my evolutionary work one of the one of the reasons why religions are so successful and certainly abrahamic religions so successful in frankly parasitizing human minds is because they play on that coalitional psychology right there is the the jews and the goyim there is the believers and the kuffar in islam right the non believers which is a derogatory term there is the the believers in christianity and the rest who are never going to get redemption because they didn't accept jesus in their heart so all of these religions have a very clear demarcation between us and them now different religions might decide differently on how to treat the them but they all play on that coalitional psychology, right? If, if they were preaching something that was contrary to the neuronal circuitry that, <clears throat> that's in our brain, then they wouldn't be successful. But they're piggybacking on these systems. And so you're right. Once you go on social media, you really see the tribalism come out. And I, you know, just like you, because I do see sometimes when you put out a tweet, I see that it kind of personally upsets you when you see how people are being unfair to you. I, I feel the exact same way because, you know, one of the things that my mother once told me that arguably is the most profound thing she's ever uh, told me, this was, I was a young kid, she said, you know, God, you better learn that the world doesn't operate according to your purity bubble, right? That's, that's an incredibly profound because she's saying, look, you have this view of this beautiful, pure world where people are going to abide by those expectations you have of them. But that's not how the world operates. And the quicker you 
you close that incongruity, the happier you will be. Well, I still haven't learned my lesson because I go on social media and I remain baffled by the type of hatred that one can receive. There's zero hatred. And I, I, I mean, from what I know of you, and I, I get the feeling that I know you quite well, even though we haven't met face to face, there is nothing, if I can speak for both of us, in our hearts that is dark towards anybody. We're, we're, we're trying to navigate through a difficult, complex world to the best of our abilities. We're trying to introduce positivity to the world. But yet a lot of other people don't don't view our interventions in the same way. So yes, I, I share your frustrations. Yeah, it's a difficult position to be in. Um, you brought up deontological principles and it's hard to know what percentage of people live by that or live by those and what percentage don't. Because even again, with social media, it creates a distorted picture because I feel I certainly get the sense that the majority of people, certainly that I personally know and am close with, friends, family, people I closely associate with, of course, there's going to be selection bias here. Um, it's for the most part people who do have real principles and values, and they don't just sort of flip flop depending on how it affects their team or their, you know, their politics or this or that. It's not so tribal. Um, but then a lot of what you see online and what a lot of what you see amplified, it is this very hyper partisan, hyper tribal, you know, if something is going viral, I always say by definition, it means that it's not normal, right? If something if an interaction is going viral, or if it's making the news, by definition, it's not normal. So people will point to things going viral and point to things in the news and see, oh, look, this is happening all the time. And I'm like, well, you know, all of these trillions of human interactions that are happening every single day, hundreds of billions, trillions, where where it's peaceful and it's amiable and it's civil and people are getting on and they're not attacking or killing or insulting each other, it doesn't make the news, right? If a police officer goes and does something crazy and hurts or kills an innocent person, no matter where you live in the world, anywhere in the English speaking world, it's going to go viral. You're going to hear about it, everything. I don't know how many I mean, just doing the math, there's 330 million people in the US. There must be over 1 billion police citizen interactions per day in that country. Yeah. And very clearly, at least 99% of them must be at least fairly positive and nothing crazy. It, you, that doesn't make the news. But as soon as something bad happens, it gets amplified. So I myself sometimes have to remind myself that, okay, that is very real. And this tribalism and this hatred and this anger, this, this is very real. This is something that exists. It's not relegated to history. It's still here right now. But I have to avoid falling into the trap of most or all people are like that because right. then you also fall into the darkness, right? You also fall into this dark mindset of, wow, everybody is just has just got this dark heart and this hatred and lack of principles and all of that. I, I think I, I would describe both of us, I think, um, as realistic optimists exactly right <laughs> that's right and actually there's a book by matt ridley the evolutionary biologist who was in the house of lords in, in britain i think it's called the rational optimist so you you call it you, you slightly changed that, that term realistic optimist look uh, by disposition i'm someone who's happy uh, and you know maybe we'll talk about the happiness book later uh, and I, by disposition i'm someone who's who's playful who jokes around but I'm also, as you said, a a real a realist. Except when I succumb to that purity bubble that my what my mother warned me about long ago. But that's why, precisely, you will often see on my uh, Twitter feed where I put. I mean, I, I I don't do it strategically, but I'll just give you an example. To your point about you know not everybody is a mean you know person. Uh, you know, I shared a lot of difficult. Uh, you know, positions that I took over the past few weeks discuss. And, and at one point I put out a tweet that did go very viral over 10 million people watch it where I was, you know, quite pessimistic about the plight of the West. But then a few days later, I wanted to also honor the fact exactly to your point that most many interactions are truly beautiful and hopefully speak to a universal brotherhood where I, re you know, I receive a, a million emails a day. And, you know, here, here comes a Pakistani guy. Here comes a guy from Kuwait. Here comes a person from Iran, all of whom are saying, we really support what you're doing. We're your brothers and so on. And the reason why I'm picking those countries, because they're Muslim countries, it's Pakistan, it's Yemen, it's it's Afghanistan, it's right. And so, yes, most people are lovely. Every religion, every tribe has mean and good people. 
And it's it's a great thing for us to to remember that within all of the quagmire that we're facing. Yeah, absolutely.